All right. Well, uh, so this is Dr. Morton, and I'm um, recording a video for uh, the 13th for uh, Logic Design. Uh, and what we're going to, first we're going to pop up the syllabus. Let's just do that. And here we are on week 12. Uh, sorry, let's see. Yeah, and this is the 13th, and we're going to talk about unit 16. Um, <clears throat> All righty. And then uh, remember, uh, so homework 10 was due uh, on Wednesday. Homework 11 will be due on the 16th, which uh, is Monday. And then we just have a couple more, and we're done. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so next week, the 13th, uh, there's only one more week after it. That's it. That's all there is. Uh, so we're really rocking to the close. All right. So let me, um, let me shrink myself down and we'll do this. And we'll do this. Okay. So, uh, and we'll maybe just move it over just a little bit more. And maybe I'll switch it so I can be over in this, this part of the image. Okay. Yeah, that's good. And maybe I'll even roll this down a little bit. Okay. So, um, so we're going to cover 16. We're going to talk, kind of review sequential circuits again, talk about the code converter example. We're going to talk about design by iteration again. We've talked about that before. That's how we, that's how we did our, um, let's see, hold on, let me get the, sorry, uh, paint it here. That's how we did the, uh, uh, the adder. Remember, we designed a one-bit adder, and we daisy-chained four of those together to get a four-bit adder. That's designed by iteration. So we iterated uh, the one bit adder uh, four times. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, how we can use uh, a ROM to uh, do a sequential design. And we'll, we'll briefly mention uh, the uh, programmable logic. Uh, the, program, the programmable logic world has really shrunk pretty much into uh, CPLDs and FPGAs. And all the other things that we used to have are pretty much not used much anymore. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, a little bit about simulation and testing and computer-aided design. Okay. So, um, so you know that when we do a sequential design, we start with typically our state graph, sometimes also the state table. And then from the state graph, we uh, generate a state table. Then we look at the state table and, just, and see if there's any way we can uh, 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 eliminate some uh, redundant states or equivalent states. Now, redundant states fit into that unique problem where you read in some finite number of values uh, and then you uh, reset. If so, if you have that type of problem, you can eliminate uh, redundant states. But if you have basically another problem then you need to use the implication table and see if you can uh, see if you can eliminate some equivalent states then you need to think about flip-flop state assignment uh, and you should see if you can apply the guidelines in section 15 8 uh, for doing adjacent assignments and maybe think about novel solutions like the one hot assignment which uh, you might consider if you if you're using programmable logic uh, like a CPLD or an FPGA, and you do have uh, extra flip-flops available. Um, all right, then you substitute in your flip-flop coding, uh, your flip-flop assignment for your states, uh, and that gives you your transition table. And then from your transition table, you extract uh, the, uh, the, the information for the uh, inputs for all the flip-flops, assuming you're using D flip-flops, and uh, construct k-maps for those, and then you uh, construct a k-map for the output, and then you uh, look at your uh, minimal your your minimal solutions for, the, for all your uh, uh, k-maps, and you go ahead and realize the equations, and then you take the equations uh, and you uh, uh, 
well, for, first you verify the design with test data using either a, a, test, a test bench uh, or a simulation. And then you, um, and then you uh, go ahead and, and implement your hardware. So that's, that's sequential design. All right, so we're going to work a problem. And the first problem we're going to work is called this uh, code converter problem. And uh, what it does, it's uh, this. This is this is the third time we've seen this. Now we're gonna we're gonna take uh, BCD to XS3. Now again, we've we've done this several times. The last, the first time we did it, we did it as a combinational design. We took a we took a combinational uh, circuit. We we had uh, f four bits of input, which were the BCD codes, and we allowed those to generate four bits of output, which is our XS3. We did not need a sequential design to do it. Uh, whenever you put your four bits in, you would get four bits of XS3 out. Uh, then the next time we did it, we did it with a sequential design that was kind of a, a little bit goofy. But what we did, we, uh, we preset four flip-flops with the BCD code, and then we ticked the clock one time, and the flip-flops would change and be generating the XS3 code. Uh, now what we're going to do, we're going to actually have an input stream and it's going to have uh, X coming in and we're going to get four, four values of X and then after we get, uh, and we're going to output four bits of XS3. Now one of the questions is, can we, can we immediately output the first bit of XS3 when we get the first bit of BCD in? And, uh, and you'll see that it turns out the answer is yes, we can do that. Uh, but we have to sort of inspect the, uh, uh, the table and see if that's really true because it, it, it might be that we'd have to get the first two bits before we could put out the first one bit of XS3. Uh, and so it turns out though we, we can do it on the, each, each bit we get in, we can output a bit of XS3. And so that's how we're going to do it. And, uh, and, and that's really more like a real state machine. Now, this probably wouldn't be the optimum way to do it. The optimum way to do it would be to use a combinational design and, and have it available uh, after uh, just a, a, a couple of propagation delays through, through two layers of gates. Uh, but we're going to do it this way as a, as, a, as a sample problem. And of course, all this really does, it adds three to a BCD code. So if you put in a BCD for zero, you get out three. And if you put in a BCD of one, you get out four, and so forth. And, and any of you that did uh, one of the logic, uh, one of the problems, one of your uh, group projects that didn't use um, that didn't use uh, that, yeah, so many of them uh, used uh, XS3 in some manner. And if you did that, or even XS2, you, you you're familiar with this. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're first we're going to analyze the problem by looking at by simulating the input stream and we're going to make a table with all the possible input sequences and then the desired output sequences and then we're going to ascertain if we have to have a delay or if we can immediately output uh, the when we get in the first bit of the BCD code and we'll start with the low order bits can we output the XS3 code and now of course uh, um, yeah so that, that'll be how we do it. It turns out that we have to do low order first, otherwise we wouldn't be able to out output the first bit. We would have to then, we'd probably have to read it in all four bits before we could send out anything if we did it high order to low order. But we're going to do low order to high order. All right, so let's look. So here's our kind of our analysis. Uh, here's our input X in BCD. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then we're not listing... Uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. That'll be don't cares. And then we have our output. This is XS3. So if we get in 0, we have out 3. If we get in 1, we have out 4, and so forth. Now, if you look at this, let's see if, if, if we can make sense. So if we get in, so in every case, when we get in a 0, what do we output? Well, it turns out for this one, a 1. What about for this 0? A 1. What about for this zero? A one, this zero, a one, this zero, a one. So, it, and then what about the one? Yes, for every one we put out a zero. So it turns out, for the first bit in, we're just gonna we just output the opposite. 
So so we so it turns out for every single zero we get in, we we do have we do have enough information to output the first XS3 code. And then and then what what about the for the first two in? Well let's say let's say we get zero zero in. What do we output? Well it would it would be the second one would be a one. So for any time we have zero zero, we'd output one one. What about when we have and then let's go down here. Zero zero one one zero zero one one. So every time when we get this when the second bit is a zero, uh, after the first bit being a zero, well, then we output a one. What about uh, zero one? Well, zero one it's zero zero. Here's another zero one. It's zero zero. And here's another zero one. It's zero zero. So every time we output a zero one, we we get a, a zero zero. What about one zero? Every time we have a one zero, we get, we have to output one zero, the opposite. So it's zero one, and then one zero. So here's another zero one, one zero. That's the same, and that was the only. There's only two of those. And then finally, what about um, one one? Well, every time we get one and a one, we should output zero one, one and a one zero one. So it looks like that we're good for the first two. What about the first three? So every time we get zero zero zero, what do we output? One one zero. And what about zero 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 here? One one zero. Okay. And so that's fine. What about one zero zero? Everywhere we have one zero zero and here's a let's see, one zero zero, one zero zero. So here we put out zero zero one and here we put out zero zero one. Okay. And if you go through this analysis you'll see that for all the combinations we we can we can put out uh, in our XS3. We once we get each bit in, we can immediately put out the next bit. Now we do have to remember to to know what bit to put out for the second bit and the third bit and the fourth bit. We have to remember the previous bits. But it but we don't have to have a delay. We we can do this without getting all four bits in. Okay. So now we've kind of sorted that out. Let's let's think our way through this. So we start in we start in in, uh, in uh, node uh, A where we haven't we're waiting for the first bit to come come in. If we get a and here we did uh, the inputs in red and the outputs in blue. So we get in a one and we output a zero. And that puts us in C. Here we get in a zero and we output a one. That gets us to B. And then here, we, I don't know why these colors all changed. Here in C, if we get in, uh, well, let's let's do the zero one. If we get in zero, zero, then we, zero, 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 we output one, one. So that would be one, one, and so forth. So we build this up following this, following our, our, our analysis um, table here and this basically helps us to sort this out all right and it turns out then uh, for all these things it, it works out and then we have we get to the final path and this path then we're gonna go all the way back to the beginning so all these go through a common path all the way back here now notice an L and J and N and M and K and P, we only have one output. The other outputs that don't care, so that's why we didn't list it. So we can pick it however we want. All right, so that's great. So now, uh, now we can do, uh, so look at all the states. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. All right, so now there's our state graph. Now we can build our state table. So we have 15 rows, and we have all these states. Now, uh, this these are these this is time t0. So we have our first our first value comes in, and then we go to either uh, state b or c. Then our second value comes in, we go to state either d, e, f, or g, and the third value comes in, we go to h, i, j, k, l, m, n, n, p. We're missing o for some reason. And then our fourth value comes in, and we're back up here to state A, which we call reset. Whew. 
Okay, so that's where we are. And then what about our, and then our outputs are defined here, but these are all don't cares. Okay, so, and, uh, and he's, these are don't care next states too. All right, so, uh, so what can we do with this state table? Well, obviously, if we can, we should try and reduce it. Now, we did a problem very similar to this when we looked at chapter 15, and we went through a state table, and sure enough, we looked for any state that had the same outputs and the same next states. Now, the don't cares can be taken however you want. So basically, uh, state H, I, J, K, and L all have uh, A as a next state here, and then A's here with don't cares there. So you, we could just take these as A's. So, th so basically, these states all have the same uh, next states for x equals 0 and x equals 1. And then for x equals 0 and 1, they have 0 for x equals 0. And one's here but don't care is here so we so all the way through here we can make these all the same now these are a little bit of a problem because there's a one here so m n and p can all be the same too because we have don't cares here and don't cares here so we basically then can reduce p and n and substitute in m we can reduce l k j and i and substitute in h so we do that we cross out these and we cross out those, and we put in all our substitutions. Now let's look at it again. Do we have any any new states that are redundant? Well, let's see. So D D is uh, state D is H H and zero one, E is H M and one zero, F is H M and one zero, and G is H M and one zero. So son of a gun, looks like G E F and G are all the same. But D is kind of by itself, so we're gonna, so we can, so we should be able to reduce G and F and substitute in E for those. And there we go, and those are E. Now, do we have any other states? And yeah, it doesn't look like we do now. So it looks like we're down to our to our minimum number of states. And so we're left with M, H, and then A, B, C, D, E. All right, but not bad. We, we did eliminate quite a few states. We eliminated 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that's not bad. That's going to help us a lot. So now, uh, now we have our reduced state table. And here's what it looks like. All right. Now our state numbering is a little goofy because we, we have A, B, C, D, E, H, M. But so be it. We could, we could rename these if we wanted, I guess. Okay, so, um, so, so here's our reduced state table. And this is, this is really going to help us because now we only have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So now we can get by with three, three flip-flops. All right, so now so we'll, we'll name our flip-flops uh, since we used letters for our states. And again, the book has been very inconsistent in this, but I, I promise on the test, I'm going to use, I'm going to use uh, letters for flip-flops and S0, S1, S2, S3 for states. And uh, our inputs are going to be X's. X, if we just have one, it'll be X. If we have multiple, it'll be X, X0, X1, X2, X3. And our outputs will be Z's. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so we're gonna. So next step is uh, we're gonna do state assignment, flip flop state assignment. All right. So uh, we have seven states. So we need a minimum of three flip flops. Three flip flops could handle uh, eight states, and we only have seven. So we'll have a we'll have a don't care state. That'll be great. And so uh, we're gonna call our flip flops Q1, Q2, Q3 because the book used letters here. Um, all right. So. Here's our so we're going to create a little K map here, called Q1, Q2, Q3. Now, this is just to do our state assignments. Now, remember our rules from section 15.8: states with the same next state uh, for the same input should have adjacent assignments. Uh, states that are the next states of the same state, and then 
if you want to deal with the output states with the same outputs. So those are sort of your guidelines. Okay, so let's look at that. So, so, so for instance, D and E are states are the next states of the same state. So you probably want to give D and E uh, assignments. Here we have D and E also have H as the output for X, and although they have different outputs for X equals one, uh, they have the same for X equals zero. So you might also consider D and E to be adjacent. So definitely probably want to make D and E adjacent. And then, um, then let's see, uh, H and M have the same next states. So you definitely could give them adjacent assignments. So H and M, and then otherwise you just go right down the list. Uh, B and C are the next states of the same state. Uh, D and E are the next states of the same state. And then E, E, H, H, H and M are the next states of the same state. So many of these have kind of double reasons. So we definitely should have H and M adjacent, D and E adjacent, and we might as well have B and C adjacent. All right, so how do we make them adjacent? Well, so we have B and C adjacent here. We have D and E adjacent here and H and M adjacent there. Now, I did them vertical, but you could do them however you want. And then, uh, because, um, yeah, I guess there weren't really, yeah, I don't, I guess B and C could be adjacent because of EE. Did we make B and C? Yeah, B and C are adjacent here. So there you have it. Uh, that's pretty much, uh, and obviously, is this the only way you could do it? No, absolutely not. Oh my goodness, there's thousands of ways to do it. But the, but doing this out using a K-map is kind of helpful because you know if you put them in boxes connected, then that, that qualifies as the adjacent. And remember, all all the adjacent assignment really means is that, they only, that the assignment coding only differs by one variable. All right, so state A is going to be coded 0, 0, 0. State B would be coded 1, 0, 0. State C is going to be coded 1, 0, 1. H is going to be uh, 0, 1, 1. Uh, D is going to be 1, 1, 1. M is going to be 0, 1, 0. And E is going to be 0, or 1, 1, 0. All right, so that's it. So we pull those out like this. And A, A, A B, C, D, E, and H, and M. And here's their assignments. So you can see they're by no means are they continuous. Uh, so that so then we're going to go ahead and do the straight table, but then we're going to have to rearrange it so that they are in binary order, so we can pull them off into the K maps without going crazy. All right. So so we set this up here, uh, uh, A B C and so forth, and then uh, we we build the transition table. We're gonna we're gonna substitute in then. For all these values, we're going to substitute in this coding with Q1, Q2, Q3. And there it is. And now, notice that this is not in binary order, but we would have to, we just have to, preserving each row as exactly the same, we rearrange these rows so that they are in binary order. And there we go. Now we're in binary order. Um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And the seven, oh, uh, and this one is a don't care. And we also had uh, some don't cares there. All right, so so with, with that in mind, now we can make our K-maps. We need a K-map for Q1, and K-map for Q2 and Q3. Now, what are the variables? Well, our variables are going to be our three flip-flops, Q1, Q2, Q3, and our input X. So we have four variable maps. And here they are. Q3, the D input for Q3, or we call it Q3 plus. The D input for Q2. So here's here it is for Q3. For Q2, it's really simple. We get all these lined up like that. Here it is for Q1. I, I guess I didn't write the expression here, but it's going to be uh, it's going to be. Uh, this so it's going to in this case this would be x uh, q2 prime and this is going to be uh, x prime b or x prime q3 uh, q1 prime and so forth so you you just write all these out 
and then once you get all this done, now you can now you could build your circuit. And I, I didn't actually construct the circuit, but you would take these expressions and do the circuit. And I, I don't know why I didn't do this expression. I guess we should we could put that in. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do that right now. So if we put that in, that would be. Uh, So that would be, um, so what did I say? I said x, uh, x q2 prime. Yeah, so it's going to be, uh, it's going to be x uh, q2 prime. Yeah, that's confusing, isn't it? But I guess. Okay, and then uh, plus um, and then we're going to do, so there's th yeah, three terms, x q2 prime, and then we're going to do x prime q3 uh, q1 prime. And that's going to be the, the wraparound. So that's going to be uh, x Rhyme uh, Q uh, Q one prime. So we'll do that one, and then we'll do that, and then we'll do plus. Um, and th then the last one will be uh, uh, Q3 Q3 um, Q2 Q3 Q2 and we'll make the box bigger here and no primes there. Q3 um, and Q2. All right. And so that's the answer for that one. Okay. And we'll save that. I don't know why I never did that one. And now we could just build a circuit. So we'd have to have. Uh, one, two gates here, or sorry, three gates here. One, two, three, four gates here. Um, five, six, seven, eight gates. So eight gates would do it, and uh, three flip-flops, and that would give us our circuit. Okay, now we can also do this with a read-only memory, and that's, that results in a little bit different process. What we do, we use the ROM to, to implement the combinational portion, and then we add some external flip-flops to hold our current state. Now you think, well, read-only memory, why can't the ROM serve as the memory? Uh, because, you, you, because the ROM's not going to change on the clock. That's, so it can't hold the state. The state has to change on the clock, and the ROM's not going to change. Now we can program the ROM, but we don't do that in the midst of our... Uh, execution we program the ROM before we uh, when we build the device and then we leave the ROM alone while the device is actually working and and that's generally how we use ROMs so we use D flip-flops now when, whenever we create a design with a read-only memory it's very important to use D flip-flops or maybe T's I guess but you don't ever want to use JK's because uh, your ROM has to be a lot bigger because you have to store two variables for every flip-flop instead of just one. If we use Ds, we only have to store the D in the ROM. But if we use JK, we have to store JK for each flip-flop. And you can do either Mealy or more. And the ROM's going to be addressed by the inputs and the current state, which will be the flip-flop outputs. So how many flip-flops do we need? Well, that depends on how many states we have to have. And, uh, you know, how many inputs are required? Well, 
again, it depends on the problem. And then the ROM outputs are going to drive the flip-flop inputs and the circuit outputs. So how many outputs and how many flip-flop, uh, how many, uh, how many uh, D inputs? So uh, how do we figure this out? Well, so the, uh, the reason we need to know this, this drives the rows and address lines. And this drives the, uh, the columns and the output lines. All right. So we use the same state table for the code converter, and we wind up with seven states, one input, and one output. All right. So, and we have three flip flops. So now we have to figure this out. So if we go back here, so how many flip flops? Three. How many inputs? One. How many outputs? Uh, there's just one output. And how many, uh, how many D flip flop inputs? Well, one for each flip flop, and there's three. So we have to have a total of four outputs and four, uh, four, row, four address lines. Okay? There's four address lines. So that means we're going to have 16 rows. All right. So, we, so basically now we, we set this up. So here's our transition table, same one we had before. And now what we do is we need to populate the flip-flop. Now, since it has the input X and our four and our current state of our four or our three flip-flops, and then we have one output and our desired next states, which we'll call the Q1 plus, Q2 plus, Q3 plus. Here we're going low order to high order, I think. Or no, maybe we, yeah, I guess we went high order to low order. So Q3 is low order. We probably should have reversed those. But in any event, so how do we get this information in the ROM? Well, it's really pretty straightforward. We're just going to pull. We're just going to pull it straight off of here, and then we have to add the outputs in. And since x is one of our inputs, x equals zero. So so x equals zero will be the first half. See here's x. So x equals zero will be the first half. And I, maybe I'll maybe I'll add that in here. I think that would be a really good thing to do. Oh, maybe it won't. Yeah, it will. Okay. So we'll do that right here. And then we just drop this down. And then we'll, we'll just go ahead and call this here. This will be... And then we'll, we'll just replicate this and make this x equals 1. And we'll put this down here. OK. And we'll save that. That'd be good. All right, so now you can see so this is this is the x equals zero part. So let's let's pick q1. So we, it'd be zero 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 one 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 one. All right. So go back here. Zero zero. Oh, wait a minute. Did we do three first? Um, maybe we didn't do that. Oh, this is the desired next state. Got it. So uh, right. So here's what our ROM's going to be. So it it has to be. Well, we can look at our output z. Uh, the, 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 but let's let's do z first. So the z is going to be one one zero zero one zero one. Don't care. All right. One one zero zero one zero one. Don't care. And then our uh, q one is going to be zero zero one 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 zero zero. So zero zero one 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 zero zero don't care and then our q2 is going to be zero one zero 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 don't care so zero one and then all zeros in a don't care now what about the x equals one well the the for x equals one the imp, the output z is going to be zero zero one one zero one don't care don't care all right and here it is, 0, 1, 
uh, sorry, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, don't care, don't care, and so forth. So you, you do have to pay a little bit of attention, but you're just, but for the x equals 0 part, you take these all these rows, and they go in the first half, and this row. And since we made this first, you put this row with the don't care uh, over here, and, and this, this should be what the ROM looks like. So the first row would be 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. And the next row should be 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and so forth. And then the last row would be, well, this row would be 0, 0, 0, uh, sorry, 1, 0, 0, 0. And then the next one would be don't cares. 1, 0, 0, 0, and don't cares. And then for the x equals 1 part, then, uh, sorry, then you do this. All right. Anyway, uh, so it, it would just it's just these columns preceded by this column. So the first row would be zero zero one zero 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 one zero, and the last row would be uh, all don't cares. In fact, we have two rows of don't cares. Don't care. Don't care. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. And then. What you can see is that this yellow area is what actually populates the ROM. This is just the you know this is just zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. That this is just binary order. Okay, and here this populates the ROM, and this would be the address of each row, and we have four address lines, and that gives us sixteen rows. So here are here are four address lines a0, a1, a2, and a3, uh, where x is the higher order. I guess I should have put it probably ordered them the other way. So here x is the higher order, then q1, q2, q3. So here x is the higher order, then q1, q2, q3. Here here are outputs 0, 1, 2, and then 3 is z. And and that's how we did it here. Well, yeah. Did I did that right. Yeah, we did it. Z one two three, right? Z one two three. Okay, yeah. So that works out. And then these are going to drive our fleet three flip flops. So uh, I this is uh, yeah. I didn't don't know that I have these labeled Q one Q two Q three. So this D input should go to this one. This D input should go to this one. And this D input should go to this one. And then our Z outputs right here. And the clock drives these flip-flops. And that's all there is to it. And every time the clock ticks, then the flip-flops will change because they have some D being presented here. They'll shift to the new state. And then the output Q is goes around and it's input here in the address lines. And, and then the next input X is locked, is, is latched in. Uh, and that addresses the ROM to generate this new set of outputs to drive the flip-flops and, and the output Z. So this is how you implement it with a ROM. And, and in fact, in our programmable logic, that is, that is exactly how we do it. Uh, we, we implement it with a ROM just like this all the time. Uh, in, the, in, the, in our FPGAs, we call these ROMs, uh, we call them lookup tables, but they're the same thing. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about iterative design. Uh, I may wind up. Uh, I may not quite get this finished today, but that's okay. So some some operations are just natural for an iterative design. Some are clearly not. Uh, so when you're doing a ripple adder, although we don't normally make ripple adders anymore, but obviously we do. We do do some iterative design, even even with adders, because a lot of times what we'll do is we'll make a carry look ahead adder uh, for four bits, and then we'll daisy chain those identical groups of four bit adders that are carry look ahead. They're not carry ripple, but then we'll we'll daisy chain them together, uh, or sometimes we'll use, do comparators. Or, or there's a number of circuits where we're applying the same logic to to 16 bits, 32 bits, 64 bits. So design by iteration is a good idea here. Um, when we're looking at these 
it, these iterative designs, we want to we want to ask ourselves, what signals have to trans have to be transla transferred from one mod one cell to the next, and which direction do they need to be transferred? Now, when we do addition, we're transferring from low order to high order. We're transferring that carry bit, but we do the we do the low order. We do the one you know we do the 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 two to the zero power first, and then we do the two to the one power, then two to the two, two to the three, and so forth. Uh, and you have to do the low order first. You can't start with higher. Uh, you, you, it wouldn't work out to do that. <sighs> because you would be carrying your, your carry downstream to the low order bit, which makes no sense. When you add, you know, six and five and you get 11, you put down your one and you carry the one to the next high order bit. You don't go the other way. Well, but in a comparator, that's totally different. We always compare the higher order bits first. So let's say you have four bits. Well, if 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 you have an A and a B in each four bits, and you compare the higher order bit, and the A bit is a one and the B bit is a zero, you're done. You don't even have to look at any other bits. You already know that the A is higher than the B because the A because the higher order A bit is a one and the higher order B bit is a zero. So B can never be bigger than A, even if it's zero one one one, and the A and the A is one zero zero zero. One zero 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 is still bigger than zero one one one. So you only have to do the higher order bit. But then if they're equal, then you have to do the next bit and the next bit and the next bit. So and what information do you have to pass from bit to bit? Well, in a comparator, you have to pass from higher order to lower order, and you have to pass two bits worth of information. You have to pass whether they're equal, or whether they, uh, or whether A is bigger than B, or whether B is bigger than A. So those are three different things. And then you, and then since it takes two bits, you got a don't care thrown in there. All right. So if we look at a parallel adder, here's how we did it. We took four one-bit adders, one bit of B, one bit of A and one carry in, generating a sum and a carry out. And the carry out from this uh, this adder goes into the carry in of this one. The carry out here goes to this carry in, the carry out here goes to this carry in, and we finally get a carry out out of, out of our high order bit. So that gives us this, this uh, picture. And buried inside here are these extra carries. We don't show these outside of this. But here's our four bits in for A and B. Here's our four bits of sum, here's our carry in, and here's our carry out. And uh, so that's an adder. If we're going to do a comparator, we'll go down this way. Here's our comparator. We're going to compare A and B. And um, uh, sorry, we're going to compare X and Y. And we're going to, and our A and B are the signals we have to pass. And the way this works is, uh, if A is a 1 and B is a 0, or if they're both zeros, they're equal. If A is 1 and B is 0, then we're going to say that, uh, that that X is greater than Y. Uh, sorry, X is less than Y. And if B is, uh, if B1 is true, if B is true, we're going to say X is greater than Y. So here, X is less than Y. Here, X is greater than Y. And if they're, and if they're both zeros, we're going to say X equals Y. And that's so we have to pass those two bits of information all the way down, and these bits will uh, will dominate. It doesn't matter what these what these are. If if uh, one of these is a one, then then uh, we don't even have to really do the comparison. But but the circuitry is there anyway. And here's what. Now one of the things we can do we can always convert these iterative designs, the parallel designs, by putting on some flip-flops to hold the information and then by clocking it in. And so here's our comparative cell. And, uh, but I don't think we show uh, where we get the X's, but we would have to have shift register to prevent, pre present the X and the Y. Yeah, and I'm not gonna spend any time on this because that's really confusing anyway. Um, all right, so um, yeah. Okay, I think I'm going to, I'm not going to really go through this. Well, okay, so here's how we would do it if we were doing, a, if we're doing an adder, right? So here's an adder. We have uh, our X here and our Y here. And um, 
we have these are shift registers. We start with the zero, the lower order bit, and we shift it to the right after we get this done. So we connect the lower order bit to our X and Y inputs. We connect our flip flop output to our carry in, and we connect our flip flop, uh, our carry out to our flip flop input. So every time we clock it, the carry out is latched into this, and and then then we have the carry available for the next for the next uh, for the next higher order module, and and the clock also shifts the shift registers. So basically, we have the new uh, x and y, we have the new carry in, and we generate the new sum and the new carry out. Now somewhere we have to take this sum and save it, and normally what we do is we just shift it in to one of these shift registers. So then x would be disappeared and it would wind up with the sum in here and sometimes what we'll do is we'll just uh, shift around in a circle the y or, or just delete it or shift in zeros or whatever all right so so when we do a st when we do a, an iterative design um, we still have to do state assignment we have to turn the state table into a transition table we have to work the flip-flop input equations and connect the modules and we have to satisfy the initial inputs and use the final outputs. And there's an example of a comparator cell. All right, um, so uh, we'll talk just a minute about uh, computer automated design. And this is we this is your hardware description language and, and uh, all the tools that we have to either do design integrated circuits are to design bit files for programmable logic. And um, that's what we do in, in digital systems design. We we program an FPGA. Uh, it'd really be nice to have a course where we would make our own integrated circuits, but since it's so expensive to make one, uh, that's kind of cost prohibitive for the most part. Um, unless you're a PhD student at some universities where the PhD students do have to design some integrated circuits and they actually manufacture them. Um, so basically, we have uh, we when we still go ahead and generate and minimize our logic equations, and then we generate the bit patterns for programming our programmable logic. Uh, or if we're going to make a chip, then we then we create our schematic for our chip, uh, and uh, usually we do it as a high level we can. So we might not actually get the gate level for a schematic. We might just have our equations, and then we let the the we simulate it and test it. We'd synthesize it. We'd simulate it again and test it. And then we'd actually uh, go through the process of, of, uh, of, of generating uh, all of the files we need to uh, actually make the chip. And then once we have the chip made, then we would uh, lay out a printed circuit board and uh, create the, you know, all the rest of the circuit and put the chips on it and do whatever we're going to do with the chips. Um, all right, I, I don't think I'm, uh, let's see, I can't remember. Yeah, so if we're doing a, a, a CPLD or an FPGA, we basically just generate a bit file and we use an integrated development environment typically made by the company that makes the CPLDs or the FPGAs. And, and we just put in our logic equations and hit the button and it generates the bit file and figures it, you know, how it's going to uh, place it on the CPLD and what cells it's going to use, and, and that's just done automatically for us. So pretty cool. All right, I think that's the end. I think we'll stop with this, and I'm going to, we'll go ahead and upload this recording.